My law partner is not here, but we have another lawyer here, the pretty one, Louisa. Louisa, can you stand up? Just wave. She's the pretty one, so they say. And that's our website. You probably want to remember that, write that down, or request it from us. It's got a lot of great stuff. Uh, we do a lot of continuing education in exotic places, because my wife and son like hot, warm, sunny beaches, like Turks. We're, we're going next week, or Bermuda. And uh, when you guys become dentists and you want to take your families down somewhere nice and warm, get the tax right up and learn a thing or two, you will join us. Right, Lisa? Fun stuff, fun times. I'm a tequila guy. I'm a tequila snob. I like high-end tequila, so remember that, yeah? We also have another website, Dentist Legal Forms. My uh, law partner and I, we uh, offer all sorts of online legal forms. It's state-of-the-art technology for dentists. And we're going to talk about associate agreements followed by branding and marketing, okay? So, and I would just ask you, if you have any questions, we'll reserve them to the end. Associate agreements. Here's what I was told to talk about. Do I need to sign one? How much money can I make in and outside of the GTA? What about buying in, as in having the option to buy the practice that uh, I'm associating at? How does the agreement get terminated? What if there's a breach? What are the penalties like? And restrictive covenants. Are they illegal? Things like non-competes and non-solicits. Hands up if these things worry you. Hands up. Oh my good. Louisa, why is your hand up? This shouldn't worry you. You know all the answers. Okay. So, without an agreement, can you do these things? Okay. Can you set up shop, take copies of patient lists, take staff with you, advertise? Gen hands up if you think you can do these things when you have not signed an associate agreement. Hands up. Okay, it's kind of skewed. Oh, you're hesitating. Why? What do you think? No, the lawyers don't trick people. Louisa, do we trick people? Only on occasion. Only on occasion. No. Okay. Here are a whole bunch of court cases that involved those precise issues. There was no contract in place. The associate set up shop across the street, took some patient uh, copies of patient records or patient lists, uh, took some staff, and started to advertise. And in all of these cases, the principal sued and the principal lost. Okay? Because when there is no written contract, there is something called common law, which is judge-made law, and the judges have decided that these things are permissible because there's no contract. And it's reasonable, and it, it would be too burdensome to try to handcuff an associate and prevent them from setting up shop and competing and earning a living doing what you guys have obviously spent a lot of time and money trying to do, which is practice. Okay? I've written an article. Guess where the article can be read and downloaded? Website. Does anybody remember the name of the first website? Oh my god, I should have brought a bottle of tequila. That should be probably. <laughs> we, we tend to give away bottles as gifts, but I didn't bring one. Okay, what about solicitation clauses? These are clauses that basically say you will not contact our patients after you leave. Are these things legal? And if you can read the fine print, the answer's in there. But I doubt you can read that, right? You can't see that. So, how many hands up do you think a non-solicit clause is legal? Something that says, after you leave here, after this relationship in a written agreement, after it's terminated, you cannot reach out to our patients and try to bring them to your own practice. Are these legal? We got a strong hand up, yes. Why do you think they're legal? Anything, anything. You said anything that's signed is legal. Oh, reasonable. Has somebody been talking to you? What's with what's with the reasonable word? Okay, explain. Well, what if we put a clause that wasn't reasonable? That said, yeah, like within a certain radius, you can't contact them. Then you can make it too wide or something. Okay, so hands up if you think that the clause has to be reasonable to be enforceable. Who's saying no? You didn't have your hands up. Yeah, you. I was looking with the water bottle. You didn't. You think? What do you think? Do you think that if a clause is unreasonable, a judge would enforce it? No. Thank you. Good answer. So, reasonable in terms of time, geographic distance. What about non-competes? This is a, a blog post. There's over 300 on our website, and this one deals with non-competes. A non-compete is basically saying you can't practice dentistry. Forget about going after our patients or staff. You just can't practice dentistry within a certain time frame after you leave and within a certain geographic distance. Hands up if you think that's legal. So I've 
in the black. You said that if it's reasonable, it could be enforced. No, I said it's not legal. Sorry? It's not legal. It's not completely. What if it was reasonable? What if it sounded reasonable on paper? It was like, you cannot practice for a year and within a kilometer. Could those be enforced? Impressive. She stood up against me, and she was correct. Right? So there is uh, a court case. Is the, where's your tequila? It's coming. <laughs> Just send me an email. I'll send it in the mail. Just, they still do that. Okay. Uh, so non compete There was this case. There was a contract. There was a case back in the day, court of appeal, where a principal and an associate signed what was equivalent to a napkin. And it said something like, five years, three kilometers, or three miles, restrictive covenant, non-compete. And the courts examined this napkin and said, well, that's not really enforceable because a non-solicit would have done the job. It would have protected the principal enough. You don't need to be overly harsh with a non-compete. So to this day, non-competes in the associate agreement are generally not enforced. And it's, I must emphasize, it's in the context of that contract, the associate contract. Here's a slightly different scenario. What if you're buying a practice and the seller says, do you want me to stay on and help you out? I need to be your associate. And you say, yeah, stay on for a year. And I'm gonna put some non-competes in there. You okay with that? And the seller says, yeah, sure. Now, you've paid a lot of money for this practice. Are, and you're going to be depending on those non-competes in this associate agreement with the seller. Are those enforceable in the black dress? Mm -hmm. Sorry. Me? Yeah. Um, if your associate, your new associate, who's using to own the practice, wants to pick up and work somewhere else, I still don't think you can tell them they can't. Okay, so here's the difference, okay? The difference is, if you're a new grad, and you're signing some agreement that essentially makes you look, feel, smell like an employee, which is what new associates look like, it would not be fair to bind their hands and force them not to practice what they just graduated to practice. However, courts have said, if you're buying a practice and spending a ton of money on that goodwill, which are the patient records, the equipment, if you're going to Adam getting a loan and you're giving that to some other dentist and you want that dentist to sign an associate agreement, with you, where you're the principal, courts will enforce, they will uphold reasonable non-competes because they said it's unfair. You just went to Adam, you got all this money from TV, you're giving it to them, that they're going to violate this non-compete. It's still in an associate agreement, but the context is different. Do you guys get it? A lot of nodding heads. Lisa, does that make sense? Thank God. Associate agreement tips. So if you bring Luvisa an associate agreement, here are some of the things that she wants to see to make sure you're entering into a good associate agreement. Do you look like, feel like, smell like an independent contractor? How many of you know the difference between an independent contractor and an employee? Hands up. Nobody. Oh, yes. Do you want to explain it? That's a good way of distinguishing it. Did everybody hear that? So an employee, it's basically, I would consider them almost like modern day slave. They work when the principal wants, they get paid no matter what <coughs> salary. They get their time and their work supervised. Uh, and the difference is an independent contractor is almost like a separate business, a separate business unit. You are a business, you may incorporate and then offer your services to a whole bunch of dentists. And you may market yourself, you may have your own tools, you, you decide how you want to work, when you want to work. If you don't work, you don't get paid. If you work more, you get paid more, right? Employees don't have that benefit. They get a steady paycheck and everything's kind of determined. So ideally, if you want to save a lot of money on taxes and do things like uh, have your own patients, have your own equipment, you want to be an independent contractor. And here's the reality. You're going to go out there, you're going to be handed a contract that says you're an independent contractor. Right? 99% of the time, it's going to say, you're an independent contractor, you're not an employee. So why? Because the principals can get rid of you much easier if you're not an employee. You don't get the benefits of all the wonderful laws out there for employees, and, uh, and, and it, they save money. 
They don't have to deduct taxes for you, pay CPP, EI. They don't have to do any of that. You're, on, you're an independent business, so you pay those things, and they save money in the process. So when you come to us with a contract, we're gonna ask, are you truly an independent business? And if you're not, the contract should reflect that, okay? Because you wanna be protected too. You want those employee-esque you know, type uh, benefits. Now, non-compete, non-solicit. We talked about the non-compete generally not being enforceable, but they're gonna be in there anyways. And your principal is gonna to refuse to remove it because somehow, some way, they think that they're valid. So what can you do? Try to make them reasonable. What's reasonable? What would be a reasonable non-solicit downtown Toronto? Do you think 20 kilometers over 20 years would work? No? What would be reasonable downtown Toronto? You're shaking your head. You know the answer. Probably a couple, two kilometers. Two kilometers, yeah, for how long? That's the population. Yeah, so what about up north? Thunder Bay, what's reasonable? <laughs> 10 kilometers. 10, have right, you seen 25? 25. Yeah, I mean people drive 45, 50 kilometers to go to the dentist up north, right? Okay, but you wanna make sure that the non-competes and non-solicits uh, are reasonable. Okay, you're gonna find a whole bunch of penalties in your contracts, and you're gonna look at the, the whole thing and you're just gonna be like, what is this 15 page mumbo jumbo legalese document? What does it mean? And they're gonna have something in there, you're not, you may or may not be able to recognize it, but it's penalties. If you terminate early, if you compete, if you violate the non-solicit, you owe us a whole whack of money. Louisa, how much, how, how much in terms of penalties have we seen? An example. Have you seen? Thousands of dollars. Thousands. Tens of thousands. Ten, like I've seen, if you violate this agreement early, you owe us 50 grand, just like that. And if you sign that, guess what? You're on the hook for 50 grand if you violate it. Uh, we've seen chart fees. Do you know what chart fees are? So if you solicit in violation of the agreement, for every uh, patient you've solicited, you have to pay like 500 or or $1,000 to the principal as a chart fee, because you've taken the chart. Okay, there's lots of penalties, just be mindful of that. There's your chart fee. Now, right of first refusal. Huh? Hands up if, you're, if uh, anyone here is looking to buy a practice within the first two years. Hands up. Nobody. <laughs> Not one. Oh, there we go, okay. All right, so wouldn't you love to go and associate it somewhere, and in your associate agreement, it says that the principal has to give you the option to buy the practice? Wouldn't that be great? And you don't have to compete with everybody else, and, and they're obliged to do it, and it would be great. How often do these types of clauses, these rights of first refusal or option to purchase, how often do they get put in and accepted by the principal? Often or not very often at all? What's less than 0%? Is there something less than, no, nothing's less. Anyways, it's very rare. You have to be an amazing associate, and they must look at you and say, you're my succession plan, you're my future, I'll give you anything you want, I'll sign that agreement, I'll give you the option to buy. You're the son I never had. You're the son and daughter I never had, exactly. You know what, it happens. It happens. Louisa, do you consider me the brother you never wanted? No? So that means I'm the brother you always wanted, right? Yeah, okay, good. Can you negotiate? What do you guys think? Do you have to sign what's in front of you? Look at that. Who have they been talking to? Adam? Yeah. They, yeah? No? Okay. Good, good job. You can negotiate. You can push back. You can expand the pie and cut it in different slices. That's the end of our very quick associate agreement review.